Hello! Welcome to Healthcare Chairs Live. We are back. It is 2017 and it is almost time for Donald Trump to become president of the United States. Anyway, here we go. We're going to launch right in. No, no, we're not going to launch right in. Because you should, uh, you know, check out merch at hctmerch.com. You should look at our Facebook page, facebook.com slash healthcare triage. We've got lots of episodes you might not have seen in the last few weeks because you were on vacation. And of course, if you could support us at patreon.com slash healthcare triage, it helps to keep the lights on and these things from falling down on me um, as we're trying to get this all done. Anyway, having said that, now we can launch into questions. Number one, Cassie, Cassie Amburn. Are zero calorie foods really a thing? What could a person that really hates to exercise but wants to lose weight do to do so? Oh my gosh, so you, so many things there. First of all, let's start with the latter. We have episodes on how exercise is not the key to weight loss. So while I want you to have physical activity because it's good for so many reasons, it's not the key to weight loss. So the fact that you're focusing on, I don't want to exercise more to weight, don't, get it out of the system. That is not part of weight loss. You should be active for many other reasons, but that's not the key to weight loss. The key to weight loss is having a better diet. Um, now, zero calorie foods are, <clears throat> there are a few ways that that could be. One is, of course, there are some, you know, iceberg lettuce has got to have like zero calories. There are probably some vegetables that are very low in calories or very close to it. And probably, you know, celery, of course, everyone always talks about it, it takes more calories to burn it up than to eat it. But I'm guessing you're not asking me about natural zero calorie foods. You're probably asking me about unnatural zero calorie foods. What are those? Likely fiber and chemicals or non-digestible things. Stan just told us a, uh, a few minutes ago that he saw zero calorie peanut butter on the shelves. I, I, I gotta know what's in that. How could you have zero calorie peanut butter? It's almost unfathomable. It'd be like you just, I said, is it, it sawdust? I don't know. So it's going to be chemicals for flavoring. It's going to be fiber, which technically might have calories, but you can't digest any of it. So it's close to zero. It's going to be, I don't know, gums, oil, things you can't digest. They're weird. So you should not be like basing a diet on zero calorie foods. Eat foods. We have so many episodes on like what constitutes a healthy diet. We even have a poster on the Facebook page, <clears throat> um, which is about the, the episodes we've done on eating recommendations. I have a book coming out in November on, on like, bad, it's called the Bad Food Bible on foods that you think are terrible for you really aren't. So lots of ways you could eat healthy without going to like processed zero calorie foods, which I can't, I don't know. So yes, I imagine it really is that water has zero calories. I think coffee, black coffee might have zero calories. I mean, there are zero foods that don't have any calories, but don't go for all those chemicals. Just don't. Quinsoft, Quint, nope. Yeah, Quinsoft asks, my dentist wishes to sell me a $140 smartphone connected electric toothbrush. How much better are the high-end toothbrushes compared to the $20 electric toothbrushes? P.S. She is selling it, so I have zero faith in her objectivity on the topic. Wise, wise person. <clears throat> okay. First of all, there is some evidence that, you know, electric toothbrushes uh, may do a slightly better job in helping to prevent tooth decay and certainly with uh, gingivitis um, than, than regular toothbrushes. Now, having said that, we're not talking about huge differences. The most important thing, of course, is that you brush, that you use a fluoride-based toothpaste. If you're going to take a step up, however, electric toothbrushes, there's some evidence that the ones that go like this are better than the ones that go like this. but. We're talking, again, tiny studies, minimal difference. Now, when you're talking about a $140 smartphone connected electric toothbrush, what I'm betting you're getting is just reminders that it's going to record how long you brushed, and it's going to record how many times you brushed, and then it's going to guilt you into saying you didn't brush for two minutes, you didn't do it three times a day, you didn't do it right after, whatever it is. That's all you're getting for the super smartphone connectivity. I don't believe that the smartphone's actually going to, like, brush your teeth or do anything else like that. So it's probably just reminders. You can get that without the fanciness. Um, there probably are differences in the $20, the $30, 41 but that's going to be bells and whistles like, you know, reminding you to change the head. Um, I don't know how, uh, how much vibration it does. There aren't, there's not much probably. But having said that, those huge suits, those long time, you know, high end stuff, you're buying stuff that, that you probably just don't need. So yes, I think your instincts are correct. 
N Kicker asks, are there benefits to getting the HPV vaccine for men above 30 years old? If you've had no sexual activity at all, and you have zero chance of having HPV as a 30 year old man, and you're planning on having sexual activity, then yes, there might be a benefit. That constitutes almost 0% of the population that you know. Um, HPV is so prevalent and so easily caught that the vast majority of adults who already exist have been exposed to it in some way. I mean, most have it. That's the reason we have to give it to kids when they're so young. We need to get it to them before they have any sexual exposure because once you've been had any kind of sexual exposure at all, it's very likely that you've got it or you've been exposed to it. So at that point, the vaccine is useless, which is why we don't really give it to adults. Um, so, so again, if you truly, truly believe you've never been exposed, maybe there'd be some benefit, but most people, that's, that's just not the case. So yeah, it sucks, but you know, if you're a man over 30, sort of too late for you. Um, but if you have kids, I do, they're get, they've gotten and will get the shot, uh, that's who should get it. Sarah Melnick asks on the same sort of similar topic, the HPV vaccine has added several more strains since I had it. I had a relatively early version. Why isn't it recommended that I get the new vaccine for additional coverage? Same reason. Because again, if you've been exposed to stuff, and it's likely you have since that one, then it doesn't pay to get to get vaccinated. Again, I, it sucks. You know, wish the, wish the world was different, but it is not worth getting vaccinated after you've had contact with the disease. We don't vaccinate people for chickenpox if they've already had chickenpox. We don't, you know, vaccinate them for measles if they've had measles. Although that really doesn't come up anymore. Um, so, you know, if you've been exposed already, it's too late. So there's really no reason to do it. Patreon, Patreon. It was unnamed, but I thank you for your support. My friend thinks that sunscreen has dangers and you should only use it as necessary. I don't know of any dangers and she just says chemicals in response. Are there any legitimate safety concerns about sunscreen? That chemicals thing is just so baffling to me. I think I even have, uh, have a chapter in it on my book. You know, if we called water, what would it be? Di dihydride oxide, dihydrogen oxide, no one would drink it. It's water. We just made up a new name for it. That's why we don't panic about dihydrogen oxide. If we called sucrose some crazy long name, everyone would go, oh, that's a chemical. Everything's a chemical. It's all chemicals. It's all molecules. What does that mean? Um, I don't understand that. And natural stuff is going to kill you all the time. The sun, is there anything more natural? And it will give you cancer. It doesn't mean that you're safe. You know, belladonna, go out, if you go out and eat it, it's going to kill you. Digitalis comes from plants, it will kill you. You know, aspirin comes from like willow tree bark or something, and if you take too much of it, you could, you'll die. It's like natural doesn't mean safe. Made in a lab doesn't mean unhealthy. So, now that I've sort of ranted for a few minutes, there's been a lot of like cohort studies and everything else recently, which often will show that people who use sunscreen or have been exposed to sunscreen um, have higher rates of cancer. That is partially because that correlates with exposure to the sun. The people often put on sunscreen and not enough. When they are going, know they're going out in the sun, so people with a lot of sun exposure also happen to be people who would use sunscreen. It's not, cor it's not causation, it's correlation. So the causate, the RCTs that have been done don't, don't really show that. They show the opposite. And of course, putting on sunscreen, the sun will, will lead to higher risks of melanoma. It's natural, it's dangerous, sunscreen will not. Having said that, there's a new resurgence for some of the old, more older types of sunscreen, like the zinc-based ones, which are more literal blockage, like is almost like, like wearing a shield as opposed to something that's absorbed into the skin and then works inside the skin. So I have friends, they know who they are, and um, we had this debate months ago, and I was like, I did what I just did to you, and when I walked away, my daughter later told me as soon as I walked out of the room, they're like, well, I'm not listening to him, I'm gonna use the, fine. Their kids are called vampires now when they go out and they're, and they're all white sunscreen. That's fine, I don't care. Look, I wear a sun shirt. I'm one of those guys. When I was in Florida this last few weeks, I wear a sun shirt in the pool. I wear a sun shirt in the uh, ocean because I don't like sun exposure and I can't seem to keep enough sunscreen on my body, so that's what I do. That's fine. If you want to do that, that's great. If you want, but that's not because like, I'm afraid of sunscreen. I put it all over my face. I put it still on my forearm. I put it on my legs because I don't want to get melanoma and it turns out that like I don't know if it's my ulcerative colitis or the drugs that I take I'm at higher risk so I have to go to the dermatologist every year so I'm very concerned about that I wear sunscreen 
you should wear sunscreen. Sunscreen is going to prevent you from having cancer. We've had multiple videos on this, on how to apply it, what it means, all that stuff. I recommend that you go watch them. Another Patreon patron. One of the significant challenges with pay for performance models seems to be measuring the quality of outcomes. What specific things about how the US healthcare system assesses and reports quality would you like to see improved in 2017? What a great question. Um, we measured the stuff, there's, there's an old joke that talks about the, uh, the drunk guy who's outside the bar looking for his keys um, under a lamppost and, uh, and the bartender sees him and says like, you know, what are you doing? He's like, I'm looking for my keys. He's like, is this where you dropped them? He's like, no, I, I dropped them way over there in the grass. And the bartender's like, well, then why are you looking over here? And he says, well, that's where the light is. That's how we treat pay for performance. We measure the stuff we can measure. We measure the stuff that's easy to measure. We may believe that the stuff over there is the stuff that really matters, that that's true quality, but that's hard and it's expensive. So we, don't, we measure this stuff because this stuff is easy. It's where the light is. Um, we pick administrative data. We use stuff that's cheap and easy to collect and then we try to correlate that with quality and it doesn't work out so well. We also try to, to, to change things in an easy way instead of trying to really get into the weeds and do it hard. If we're really going to stick for like some kind of pay performance model, I wish we would really get granular and really stick to like what matters in quality. We should own that it might cost money. That trying to improve quality and save money at the same time often doesn't work that there are trade-offs in healthcare, that we acknowledge that it may require us to invest in time, in money, in other things, in trying to measure and, and use quality in order to measure that in order to try to pay for it to do more. We don't do that. We think everything is easy and cheap and fast, and that, that doesn't happen. Um, so I would like us to get more nuanced and refined in how we, we measure quality. Aaron Dan, no, Daniel Kuchler Tetch. Hey Aaron, long time listener, first time questioner. Woo! Are you aware of any research on stimulation of alpha EEG waves? Alpha waves are indeed associated with relaxation, but inducing them with tech? Yeah, this is one of those where it sounds very like science fiction-y and it sounds great, and I'm sure that there are products you can buy and they make really impressive claims and there's almost like no evidence that it works. Here's the thing. If this stuff worked, I mean really worked, like randomized controlled trials, we'd all do it. Like if it was, if you could just induce alpha waves and be more relaxed and you know have a higher quality of life and less stress and less anxiety, my God, we'd all do it. It'd be great. That's just not how it works. You know, we don't. And it's again, it's like this isn't just me. There's no system out there. I would love to have this. If I knew that I could be more relaxed and less anxious and calmer, my God, not only would I want it, but I'm sure everyone in my household would want me to get it right now too. So. It's not, just there isn't the evidence there. We just don't know that to be true. So I wish it was, but it's not. Patreon patron, what medical TV show do you think most accurately shows what life as a doctor is like? Such a great question. Hmm. I don't know of any. Oh, I'm touching my, you know what? We're doing this mic today, sorry about that. Um, I don't know. I mean, I know, look, house is not. ER is not, ER, ER used to piss me off so much because I, I, I'd run, my friends would be all the time, when are you spending your year in the emergency room? You don't do that. I mean that guy John Carter was doing like surgery rotations in the emergency room. You spend maybe, maybe like one month in the emergency room, two months maybe, like come on, come on. No, um, that was not, house was not, Stan jokingly said Dr. Quinn medicine woman before but I still don't think that probably was that realistic. I jokingly said, what's it, Doc McStuffin or whatever on Disney? I don't know. I don't think, here's the thing, you know, like with any job, being a doctor is long periods of, you know, often like routine. Um, it's exciting. And so there is no TV show that is like that. Um, there have probably been movies that more accurately portray it than others, but you know, of course, TV and movies have to make everything glamorous and exciting and life and death. You know, in my, all my years of being a pediatrician, I can think of maybe two instances when I saved a life, and one of them was literally panic-induced ordering of antibiotics. Just like I was like, add this antibiotic, add this antibiotic, add this. I didn't do anything. I just like, ooh, more and more. And then, then it turned out that the kid was like, uh, septic and the next day they were like, wow, using all those antibiotics probably saved his life. It was not exciting. It was scary, but it was just a night of me panicking. Um, so it's like, it's just not that dramatic. In pediatrics, you know, the, the most dramatic thing you can do is almost reduce a nursemaid's elbow. That's like it. And it's like, deep, 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 you're done. 
and then the kids all better and the parents are amazed. That, it's like the most gratifying thing you can do, but it wouldn't make for a good TV. So I don't know that I can think of any. I'm sorry. Patreon patron, we have one family member who seems very wary of using a mic oh God, a microwave for vague and seemingly unscientific safety reasons. Specifically, they do not like to ever have had a plastic container in the microwave. They will use glass or ceramic only. I've seen them actually reject and throw out food if it was heated in Tupperware. Now I'm not talking about disposable cheap plastic takeout containers that will melt in a microwave. What about solid microwave safe plastic products like bowls or storage tubs? Is there any research on whether or not they do or do not taint food in any way if they're heated in a microwave. I can't see how this is a valid concern. It's really not. You're, you're on the, your, your instincts are right. You know, that, that's what they test them for, whether they impart anything in the food. They don't. You have to remember that microwaves aren't bombarding you with like gamma rays. We're not creating the Hulk. It's, you know, it's like, it's whatever frequency or wavelength. It just is sort of like heating up the water. It just heats things up. Um, it's not the kind of thing that's gonna change your DNA. or So they can test whether or not it's gonna change, you know, heat up the plastic in such a way that it's gonna melt and that stuff doesn't. So they, they can test that. Plus this is like such a low, low threat level thing. Um, people will fixate and sometimes focus on things where all the evidence in the world shows us there's really no risk. And we've done enough research that even if they do sometimes find a statistically significant risk, it's going to be very, very vanishingly small in terms of, in terms of actual clinical risk. So, no. Like, I think, I think your, your, your uh, intuition is correct. Having said that, changing people's mind on stuff like this doesn't make you popular. So I sort of give up most of the time. You know, I wrote a piece in the New York Times this week where I talked about my eye roll. My friends are used to this, as I just probably explained even with the sunscreen. They'll ask me stuff, I will explain it to them, and they'll be like, well, I don't care what you just said, I'm still doing it, and I will involuntarily roll my eyes, and I'm sure it annoys them to no end. Um, but I let it go. I don't, I don't continue to try to make them give up organic food or you know, try to convince them that GMOs are healthy or go to the mats on you know, something like gluten. What's the point? You know, everyone can do whatever they like. So I will often have one discussion, and if they continue to be like, I don't care about your data and your evidence and your science, fine, fine. I don't need to be right. If I have to choose between right and be happy, I choose happy. Next, end kicker. Is the practice of doctors allowing patients to see their notes on patient portals a good, bad idea? Does it encourage patients to be more involved with their own health? Such a great question. You know, it's such a great question that that I, you know, there should be ethics study. I'm being facetious because we, I'm actually, we, I was on a paper that actually got into the ethics around giving patients granular control of their medical records. We had a whole thing with, we got ethicists together and we talked with them about it because part of my research is actually in the use of EHRs and clinical decision support. Having said that, yeah, I think it's a good idea. Information should be, you know, free. I don't, I don't like the idea of hiding it from patients. Now. I do understand that there are some ethical concerns about giving patients, you know, total restrictive control over their electronic medical records because, of course, you know, there are patients who are drug seeking and you need access to the records to know that. There are patients who theoretically could have infections that we need to know about so we can take precautions in the hospital. And I'm not talking about HIV, I'm talking about just there are very infectious things you need to know if people have because you have to set up quarantine and things like that. So having said that, and I try to be cognizant of the idea that because patients can see the medical records, I am never insulting or terrible in, in that. So I don't fear patients getting control. Now there are concerns of like, I don't like the idea of patients necessarily seeing all their lab values before I've seen them because I will be subjected to a bazillion phone calls of people panicked because one of the obscure white blood cell counts is literally just over the line of high versus low and they think abnormal means they're gonna die when we really know it just doesn't mean anything at all. And so if you have to answer every abnormal value before you can be like, dude, I know you're gonna see this and it's totally normal, don't worry about it. Um, I get that. So I like patient portals. Um, I don't mind people seeing my notes. You will see people who disagree, but more often than not, that's because they are not comfortable with what they've written or what they've said, in which case that's really on them to change it. But I will also own that I'm, excuse me, a part-time clinician and a more full-time researcher, and therefore I probably have a view different from someone who's a full-time clinician. And if you ask them, you might get a very different response. Patreon patron, would getting two doses of the flu vaccine increase the likelihood of immunity? I asked because I was unlucky and got the flu despite being vaccinated and it sucked. 
I don't know. Unclear. I don't think they've done that study. I'm not positive. Um, I know we don't recommend it, so that would lead me to believe the probably not. Like, you know, there's immunogenicity and not. The bigger problem with the flu vaccine is often not that you didn't get enough of a, of a uh, you know, enough protection against the stuff that, that's there. It's that they have to remember that they have to make the flu vaccine in preparation for what they think is going to be the major strains of coming the coming year. And they sometimes get it wrong. Um, a new strain pops up, H1N1. Or, you know, they just thought it was going to be a different variant. And so the vaccine isn't as protective because it didn't line up. If that's the case, I'm not sure that getting more vaccine would make a difference. It's just not lined up correctly. I'm going to go with no for that reason. Um, but, uh, but I'm not positive. Strong Medicine asks, what's my opinion of HHS nominated Tom Price? Uh, I've been asked this question a lot as well as like, you know, what my opinion is of Sema Verma. And I'm just going to flat out refuse to answer that in terms of like that um, because I don't know what they will be like as, as HHS secretary or head of CMS. Um, and my opinion of, well, at least with Seema Verma, would, would only be from like personal interactions. And I don't want to sway people one way or the other. Um, we will see. Um, Tom Price is a doctor, been in Congress. I'm sure it checks all the box for like what you need to be qualified to run HHS. We've had people with far less medical training in charge of HHS. So therefore, I think probably what most people ask me, like, am I going to agree with their political opinions or the steps they're going to take? That could happen regardless of the personality. And so I, I just, I don't know. We'll have to see what they say. Having said that, I am sure, given Tom Price's uh, past statements on what he wants to see with health care reform, that we would have differences in health policy and how we would move. Um, in like what the pros and cons would be of certain actions. And we will be discussing those um, in the year to come, but that's very different than my, que my you know, questioning me on like what his ability as HHS secretary would be. I don't know. Christina Lai, are childhood allergies on the rise? If so, what's the suspected cause? So there's, that's a nuanced question because on the rise can mean one of two things. On the rise can mean we're diagnosing it more, but it was already there. Like, or it can mean that there are more childhood allergies per person than there used to be, period. This is the same thing when people say, well, autism's on the rise. A lot of that is we're actually diagnosing it. We've broadened the, de the, the definition, and we're calling a lot of things autism spectrum that we didn't before. Yes, therefore, more and more people are going to qualify for autism spectrum disorder. Same is sort of true of childhood allergies. We don't know how much of it is that we're recognizing it. We don't know how much of it is also. You have to also remember there's a lot of people that call themselves allergic when they're not. I know, you know, like a quarter of the population is trying to eat gluten-free because they think they're allergic to gluten. They are not all allergic to gluten. And if you go by their saying, I'm allergic, then the allergies are on the rise. But they're not. Um, having said that, there are also people that believe that allergies are actually on the rise. And there's the whole hygiene hypothesis associated with it, that as we've made our environments cleaner and cleaner and cleaner, and we allow, we've refused to allow kids to be exposed to stuff and get in the dirt, and, and touch the foods that they later become allergic. There's some truth to that likely, given that we now know that exposing kids to peanuts, and we've talked about this in multiple episodes, actually reduces the chance of being allergic to peanuts later on. Therefore, if we keep not exposing kids to stuff because we believe they might be allergic, that actually looks like it's causing allergies. It's a bad idea. And so then in that case, it is. So. This is almost like one where it's like if I say yes, it actually could cause the problem more because people get panicky. They don't expose their kids to stuff. Their kids have a higher risk of being allergic, and now we're perpetuating the whole cycle. It sucks. Everything's complicated. Gwendolyn H., is belly fat only associated with health problems, or is it causal? Also, why is belly fat so stubborn? So there are studies that show basically where you keep your fat is associated with higher risks of disease. Now, whether it's causal or not, we don't know in the sense that we don't do studies where we put fat on people in certain areas. We certainly know that liposucting it out of certain areas doesn't really, I think, get rid of disease. Um, it could just be that where people are predisposed genetically to deposit their fat also could be linked in some way to disease or where they deposit stuff in their artery. Who knows? Who knows? But there are associations between sort of like carrying your fat here and having a higher risk of some disease. Why is belly is fat is stubborn? It's not your belly fat is stubborn. Fat is stubborn. Um, and people are just predisposed to carry it in different areas. If you're one of the people that carries it around, there's, I will have love handles, I'm sure, until I die. I believe if I was emaciated, I'd still have love. What are you going to do? What are you going to do? You want to get down to a reasonably healthy weight. You want to eat a healthy diet. And you got to stop worrying about where your fat is. 
Justin Williams, can you comment on why so many of your HCT news videos come from JAMA? There are many other high quality journals out there, but your videos are disproportionately from JAMA. I don't think they're disproportionately from JAMA, they're disproportionately probably from JAMA journals. That's because there's a ton of them. Like there's the New England Journal of Medicine, but then there's like JAMA, JAMA Pediatrics, JAMA Cardiology, JAMA Internal Medicine, JAMA Psychiatry, all of which I know I cover. They also all happen to be pretty much high impact journals. Having said that, um, I know we cover health affairs because I'm predisposed to policy. I know we cover uh, American Journal of Public Health because I'm predisposed to public health. Um, I know this, this week's healthcare triage is doing on Journal of Medicine. I know we hit The Lancet, we hit BMJ. You know, we, we hit the journals that happen to be higher impact and those include them. I think sometimes people, when I say JAMA Pediatrics, they hear JAMA. When I say, you know, JAMA Surgery, they hear JAMA. And it's like, you're right, we do hit the JAMA family pretty hard. It's like the biggest collection of sort of American journals. And I know there's lots of Lancet journals too, but these are the ones that I read and these are, and they just happen to be of higher impact. I also, I'm sure we quote from pediatrics sometimes, because I'm a pediatrician. We quote from probably academic pediatrics sometimes. It's, it, you're, get, you're getting also a sense of like what I read. I'm not telling you I'm unbiased. I'm giving you sort of what, you know, what I'm seeing and what I'm hearing and what I'm talking about and what I think is in the news. If you guys think there's other stuff that's in the news that I'm missing, by all means, let me know. Because um, I will try to talk about that stuff too. Uh, but. Probably I have the same bent that most of the people who cover health do. There's just a collection of journals that tend to be the highest impact, that get the most press, that get the highest impact papers. That is what we cover. Trey Harris, as they talk about Obamacare appeal, can you tell me what, what the libertarian Republican answers for us with chronic manageable, very expensive conditions? High risk pools, charity, just die? <laughs> There's snarky answer and real answer. I'd say probably um, it depends on the Republican. We have an upcoming episode on Republican plans for, for replace that you should watch because there's a variety. So I'd say one is definitely high risk pools. Um, high risk pools are fine if they're incredibly well funded. They just tend not to be. So that's not a great answer, but that's one answer. Another would be that, you know, they will offer you, they are sometimes offering plans where they think that there should be, there should be guaranteed issue and uh, community ratings if you're continuously enrolled. So as long as you keep insurance, insurance companies can't charge you more and can't refuse your coverage. This of course gets screwed up if you get unemployed, um, but that is a Republican answer. Um, others are that there should be a spectrum of what they can charge, but maybe that should be constrained. And some Republican answers are just, they do feel like that's them's the breaks. Um, yeah, you, you know what, you're gonna have, you can go to a high risk pool, but it's gonna cost your fortune. Or yes, we should let insurance companies charge what they want. That's how the free market works. Yeah, so those are not satisfying answers for many, especially those that have chronic illnesses. Um, and they'd also, you know, if you work for a large company, ERISA doesn't let them charge you more. I don't pay more for my insurance before the Affordable Care Act, before anything at IU than do very, very healthy people because that's, they have to offer everything the same, you know, it's just how it goes. Every employee gets the same offerings. So I'm protected. Unfortunately, people on the individual market are not. Um, and so I think Republicans are also happy to sort of have that happen too, that go get a good job. And, and that, so, and, but that's also being flip. I, I mean, if you talk to, 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 to Republicans who are truly in the weeds with this, I think that they would say that high risk pools, continuous coverage, other ways of enforcing a mandate, there are other ways we can get around, uh, tr trying to get around, you know, how do we price insurance for people even with chronic conditions. Checking the time. One more, Headshot TV. Does your body have an insulin response to things that taste sweet that aren't actual sugar or artificial sweeteners? Great question, hotly debated. Um, and there are some that can, like there's some studies which can show like insulin response and short term changes, but nothing in the real long term. There's a lot of people that keep showing cohort studies that keep trying to show that artificial sweeteners are associated with, you know, gaining weight or insulin, uh, whatever, insulin problems and that therefore it's causal. But of course, people that also use artificial sweeteners are very much more likely often to be overweight. That's why they're using the artificial sweeteners. So it's all confounded. I've written about this many times in the blog. I suggest you go check it out. And I'll squeeze in one more because I see it. Andrew Chernoskis, I plan to do a, I plan to do couch to 5K this year. Oh, I get it. Okay, fine. Good for you. How important is stretching before or after jogging? 
Shockingly not. It's in one of my books. I think it's the second book. It's a myth. There have been no good studies that actually show that uh, stretching before exercise prevents injury. I know it's shocking, and every, every coach in the country is screaming at me right now. Um, however, you know, there's, there's very little risk. So if it makes you feel good, by all means, go ahead. Um, but there's really no evidence for it. And there's some studies in high-performance athletes that actually show decreased performance in some areas. I know, it blows your mind. Go check the book. Go buy my book. Go look. Anyway, thanks for tuning in. Healthcare treat. Oh, wait, which book was it? Um, I can't remember if it was Don't Swallow Your Gum or Don't Cross Your Eyes. Let's say it's Don't Cross Your Eyes. I don't know. Go buy it. Anyway, HTTMerch.com. Check it out. We got those great new lunch boxes. They're awesome. And look, oh, I didn't bring it today. I have that also that key fob. It's great. You should get that too. Um, Patreon.com slash healthcare triage if you can. We always appreciate your support. We should start probably promoting NerdCon um, in February. We're all going to be at NerdCon. Am I getting that right? NerdCon, NerdFighteria, woo, in Boston in February. There will be, I think, a healthcare triage live thing there. But anyway, if you're in Boston, go to the, go to the if you're near Boston, come to the, uh, the con. You can meet us all. It'll be fascinating. We're even better in person. Anyway, that's in February, like 20-something. 25th? 25th, 26th. I think I'm pulling that out of my butt. 25th, 26th. There you go. Uh, of course, watch all the episodes. Keep turning in. It's going to be a crazy year 2017 for health policy. We're going to be covering it and talking about a lot of what's going on. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you next week.